So last time we talked about the vortex. Well, what is the vortex? It's any time you have a flow of energy and it encounters an obstacle. And when it hits the obstacle, it breaks into a reverse curl, like an ocean wave or a sound wave. That's why I started this with music. Every cycle of vibration is a vortex. But what happens to sound, for example, when it hits an obstacle like a wall? The same exact thing that happens to an ocean wave when it hits the beach. There's no difference. It's the same phenomenon. And it's the same thing that happens when two electromagnetic fields collide or when two galaxies collide. It's called a vortex, it's called turbulence. And turbulence has a very interesting phenomenon that it becomes rigid. Even water, for example. You go out in the middle of the ocean where there's no waves, or not breaking waves anyway. And there's very little turbulence. Uh, you can float in the ocean very nicely, go along, ride the waves, so no problem at all. But when the wave breaks, it turns into a vortex. And that vortex, the turbulence around that vortex, behaves like mass. So normally, water is very soft. Huh? Pick some up, it goes right through your fingers, it's like nothing, no resistance, or very little resistance. But, when water becomes turbulent, like in a breaking wave, or if you slap your hand on the water, for example, huh? it doesn't feel so soft anymore, does it? <laughs> a breaking wave, if you're surfing, and you get caught in the break, it, it'll slam you into the bottom. It'll spin you, it'll hit you like a hammer. You come out of there feeling like you got run over by a truck. Seriously. But why? Because the water has become turbulent. And turbulence is a specific phenomenon that causes soft things to act hard. <laughs> the turbulence acts like mass. It hits you like a hammer instead of nice soft water. Well, the phenomenon is real. So, what happens, for example, in a more subtle medium like the mind? <laughs> See what I'm getting at here? There is a process of manifestation called paticca samupada, or dependent origination. And I've gone over this in previous series, so I'm not going to go into it again. I'm just going to flash a picture up on the screen and uh, go find the other uh, videos that deal with it, and I'll explain the details, but I'm going to assume you know it for this explanation, so do your homework, all right? Otherwise, you'll be lost. Anyway, dependent origination is also a cyclical process of uh, coming into being and then going out of existence again. So what happens when something goes into existence is that it creates all of these secondary effects. That's the turbulence. See, the cyclical wave-like motion of the process of becoming is the wave. And when it breaks, when it actually comes into manifestation, it creates all this turbulence around it. So there are all these phenomena which seem to have reality, like the ego, the mind, uh, identity, and so many personality, so many other things, but are actually only the turbulence, uh, the foam around the breaking wave of existence, coming into being, going out of being, coming into being, going out of being. It's a vibration. But it's on the longest time scale that we can imagine, which is the length of an entire human life. Nevertheless, it's a vibration. The, uh, for example, cycles of the sun, sunspot cycles and solar activity cycles go in an 11-year or 12-year cycle. That's a long cycle. 
But then there are really long cycles, like glacial ages in prehistory and so on, that took millions of years. And there are cycles, climate cycles, weather cycles. We're in the big weather cycle right now, self-created. Uh, good luck. But every cycle, every vibration, every coming into existence and going out of existence creates turbulence. And that turbulence acts like it's real matter, but it's not. When this happens on the mental level, you have all these artificial phenomena, like self, being, personality, view, uh, that ego stuff based on acquisition. This is mine, and that's mine. And look, this body is mine too. So therefore, I must exist, right? If, it's my, if something exists and it's real and it's mine, right? But wait a minute, who came up with this idea of mine? <laughs> something we project, we add, you see? That's coming into existence. And then when the wave breaks and it goes out of existence, we suffer. We suffer due to death. We suffer due to the ending of things. We suffer due to change. We suffer due to getting things that we don't like that persist. <laughs> and all these are wave phenomena. All of them are vortexes. And they're all subject to all the laws of hyperfluidity, fluid dynamics, quantum mechanics, blah, 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 blah. Right? So what does it mean in practice? In actual life, there are certain feedback loops that we can use to control the process of manifestation, the process of paticca samapada, dependent origination. As these feedback loops get more and more subtle, earlier and earlier in the process, they are easier to control. For example, the first feedback loop is between name and form and consciousness. And like I've mentioned like a million times here, if you don't have a name and form for a phenomenon, even if it happens right in front of you, you won't get it, you won't see it, you won't experience it, and you certainly won't understand it for what it is. So the uh, feedback loop between name and form and consciousness is how we are aware of things. And it also determines what we are aware of, what we're not aware of, what we're knowledgeable about, and what we're ignorant about. If we don't have a name for something, we can't know it for what it is, at least mentally. So the process of becoming, paticca samuppada, coming into manifestation, going out of manifestation, applies at the level of name and form, and consciousness. Without name and form, consciousness does not exist. We become unconscious. I've seen this so many times. I've been lecturing to a room full of people. And I'll use a term that they don't know. Um, maybe it's a technical term, or maybe it's a term from a different language, like Sanskrit or something. Or maybe it's some deep technical term in uh, Buddhism or from the scriptures or something like that. Instantly, it's like a shield drops down in front of their eyes. And now they're no longer seeing the meaning of the words. They're seeing a dream that they make up with the meaning of the word according to them. And this dream could be anything. I can remember when I was a kid, Somehow or other, I got some wrong definitions for certain terms. It's been so long, I forget what they are now. <laughs> oh, and I even used to pronounce them wrong. Like uh, epitome instead of epitome. <laughs> so uh, everybody does this, right? The result was... Whenever I heard or read that word, I would have a moment of unconsciousness. And instead of hearing epitome, I'd hear epitome. I dubbed it in. I, I hallucinated it. I dreamed it during a moment of sleep. 
If we watch ourselves carefully, we'll see that we fall asleep actually many times a day. Many times even within a few minutes. And it's always around some part of this loop between name and form and consciousness. Because consciousness is when name and form is. And when name and form goes away, by consciousness. So, this is very important, critical for self-realization. And this is why all authentic paths to self-realization start with a certain terminology. And it can be even somebody who doesn't believe in systems like Osho. He still uses a certain set of terms, uh, technical terms sometimes, to describe his particular process. That's all right. But if you don't know the meaning, you won't get it. You certainly won't be able to apply it. You won't even be aware of it. That's why this is so important. So, the froth in the wave, the uh, foam in the water, the turbulence around the curl, this is what actually gives these things their effect. And it's an effect that is much bigger than you would suspect or imagine just by looking at the phenomenon analytically. Because you can't anticipate how the wave is going to break exactly, can you? You can't anticipate the areas of turbulence and the areas that are going to be clear and open in the middle. Why? Because you're not even aware of the phenomenon, duh. <laughs> That's why we talk about this stuff, is to make you aware that there are these phenomena that are affecting your life in some cases ruling your life and you're not aware of them. So in Paticca Samuppada, the process of name and form is critical. In the process of becoming, your ontology, your store of phenomena and terminology is very, very important. If you don't have an adequate fund of knowledge, huh? you won't be able to even observe the phenomena they talk about. And this is why people criticize uh, spirituality. And they say that things like meditation or even consciousness are epiphenomena. An epiphenomena is like the foam on the wave. It doesn't, it doesn't have any real existence. It just happens when the wave is there. When the wave goes away, it's gone. Well, actually they have a point. Because when name and form is there, we have consciousness. And when we don't, it's gone. So, all right, name and form. We have to create a system of name and form that allows us to grasp the, or be conscious of, the phenomena we're interested in cultivating. So, if we're talking about consciousness, if we're talking about sense data, if we're talking about clinging, identification, uh, all of these things, whether we like or don't like something, sensation, and so on, we have to be cognizant of the name and form behind it. And this is the origin of all these things that say, think your way rich. <laughs> Dream your way to success. <laughs> what you're doing is you're creating a private language, a private name and form for the type of success you want to reach. And then you work with that and observe those phenomena until you get a handle on it. And then supposedly that's, that's going to lead you to success. Well, it can at least provide the foundation. And the same in spiritual things. The name and form, the system of knowledge you base your work on, has tremendous influence over its scope and power. And if your ontology, if your name and form is inadequate, you won't be able to reach the result. That's why right view is the first item of the Eightfold Path. Right view has to come first. If you don't have right view, if you don't have a proper ontology, you cannot even reach meditation what to speak, what to speak of enlightenment. What most people call meditation is simply concentration. It has been mistranslated from Pali into English. 
And meditation became a blanket term for all of these processes, but not. There's a difference. In concentration, the mind is narrowed. In meditation, the mind becomes open. And in enlightenment, it becomes open completely. So, this knowledge of vortex is very important to understand how the mind creates the illusions of I, mine, huh? you, <laughs> yours, what you did to me, and so on. All of these phenomena that we think are real are nothing but foam, they're nothing but turbulence on the wheel of samsara. And that wheel of coming and going, huh? coming into manifestation, going out of manifestation, is going on, on every scale, from the subatomic to the pan-galactic. Okay? Certainly you can see in the process of human life there is a, hmm, a phase of gestation and birth. Then there's a phase of manifestation and production of byproducts. Then there's a phase of dwindling and death. And what we don't see is that the being, the space of awareness that we are, then goes from this body to another body, from one vortex to another. Huh? This body is a vortex. Look, it has a hole in the middle. Huh? It goes down, stuff disappears, just like a whirlpool. And the Buddha even calls it a whirlpool. And he says, when this whirlpool stops, then you can attain enlightenment. When does it stop? Because it never stops. It stops when you stay in the middle. And don't touch the sides, because that's where all the turbulence is. So if you really want peace, if you really want freedom, if you really want to get away from being tossed here and there by the waves and turbulence of existence, then you have to find the middle. In martial arts, everything depends on the middle. My martial arts teachers First thing they told me was, stand, stand there, just stand there. Now lean this way, lean that way, lean this way, lean that way, until you can find the middle. That's where you settle, that's where your strength is. That's where, your, that's where you build your core strength. Well, here's the thing, there's a phenomenon called old man's strength. Through old man's strength, Someone my age can work more efficiently than someone maybe half our age or less. It's true. Ask anyone that I've taught Tantra to. <laughs> They're always going, Dave, <laughs> when are you going to stop, man? You know? They're worn out. I've worn out more Tantra partners. <laughs> Basically everyone now. It's a shame. They run away. They can't take it. It's too much. Well, too much for one person might be not enough for another. So what I'm getting at here is that due to lack of knowledge of the vortex and its properties, that we are stuck in this repetitive pattern of experience, coming and going, birth and death, habits, huh? Habits are nothing but vortexes. Being itself is nothing but a vortex. Look at a galaxy. It's just a big spiral vortex. Now the thing about vortexes is water goes into a vortex, plasma goes into a vortex, air can go into a vortex, we call it a tornado or a hurricane. Only Earth can't go into a vortex, oh really? then why is the earth constantly giving birth to itself? I mean, over a period of thousands or millions of years. The earth moves very slowly. But when it moves, we call it an earthquake. Now maybe to the earth, it's an earth, it's a birth pang. It's a birth pang. The earth splits open. Magma comes out from inside in a volcano or in an earthquake or in the movement of tectonic plates. 
and it goes back in somewhere else. So the surface of the Earth, or any tectonically alive planet, is constantly recirculating with the interior core. So what we have basically is a process of paticca samuppada on a big scale, very slow. Huh? A galaxy, it even looks like a wheel. <laughs> and it's revolving very slowly, once every hundreds of millions of years. So, paticca samuppada, vortexes, energy transformations, turbulence are everywhere. And if you understand this vortex theory, you can see it. Now, how does it imply? How does it actually work? How does it, for example, in meditation, how does it allow us to find the center, huh? the stillness within? Well, it's very simple. Emptiness. That's why we meditate on emptiness. That's why we get used to emptiness. That's why we get to feel comfortable in emptiness, because that's the middle. Emptiness is the middle. It's the neutral between yin and yang, between going in and coming out, between coming into being and going out of being, between here and there. You see, the Buddha's analogy of crossing from this shore to the other shore is actually just a trick to get you to build a raft and set off on your journey. What is the raft? The raft is the Eightfold Path. It's simply to get you started, somehow or other, working on this Eightfold Path. And the raft is actually this system of terminology, this system of understanding and practices called right view. When you have right view, you have your raft. If you get on it and paddle like mad, it'll take you somewhere. It'll take you to the other shore. But guess what? The other shore is emptiness. It doesn't really exist. And that is its solidity. That is its unconditional eternality. That is its absoluteness. It's unchanging, indestructible, immutable nature. When we realize emptiness, then Nothing in isness can scare us anymore. Why? Because the greatest threat is non existence, isn't it? You point a gun at somebody, the greatest threat is bang, I'm going to kill you. So everyone is afraid of non existence, everyone is afraid of emptiness. But once you realize emptiness, then death, where is thy sting? Because you know you can go into this emptiness and create anything you want. You can create another body, you can create another identity, another personality, or even a, another world to live in. It's a place of immense power. But people don't understand emptiness because it's beyond the mind. You can't understand it. You can experience it, that's all. So the Buddha's Eightfold Path the whole process of jhana and meditation is simply designed to take you step by step beyond being and non-being to nibbana, to emptiness. And of course the Zen people say, well the heck with that step by step, let's do it in one step. There is no path, there is no dharma, there is no Buddha, there's only emptiness. That's it. Finished. You see? There is only one path. And one path can be walked in this direction or in this direction. The same path that leads to manifestation, being, and ultimately death, when you go the other way, leads to nothingness, emptiness, nibbana. So, there's really nothing to do. There's really nowhere to go. Just turn around. 
You're on the path. You are a Buddha. But because you're facing away from your Buddhahood, you forgot. That's all. Hey, you're just human, right? So turn around. And instead of facing the world, face yourself. That is the path. Once you actually become aware of yourself, and yourself is an emptiness. <laughs> yourself <laughs> is, is beyond being and non-being, the cycle of birth and death. Uh, it, your, your emptiness cannot come into being, does not come into being, never has come into being, and never will. Emptiness is emptiness. The process of becoming can't even get started there. Because there's no difference between one emptiness and another emptiness. You can't say, this emptiness is me, and that emptiness is you. No, no. There is no qualitative difference between them. How are you going to recognize which one is which? So when two emptinesses contact, they merge. This is the point of Tantra. Tantra is not for ordinary, average, or unenlightened people, because they don't know their emptiness. They haven't realized emptiness. They don't know what they are. So when they meet another person, they think, oh, you're another person just like me, huh? Yeah, great. But in Tantra, both partners have realized emptiness. That is the specific qualification for Tantra. You realize emptiness, and then you merge with another emptiness. Because they're the same. I know what you're going to say. Well, in most Tantra, you're a man and, and the partner is a woman. How do you merge? Because they're completely different. Two bodies, so on. Two consciousnesses, etc. But at the highest level, every being is an emptiness. So it doesn't matter whether the Tantra partner is male or female. What matters is there's two emptinesses coming together. That's the whole point of it. If you see, like, mechanics of bodies, you won't get it. That's still being. That's still just the turbulence around the wave. That's still just the noise from the cycle of becoming. You're not going to find Nibbana that way. You're only going to find more noise. And this is going on. People say, oh, I practice Tantra and blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, have you uh, realized emptiness? Uh -uh. <laughs> 